Good evening, my little darklings. I'm back. It's a brand new live episode. We've got a good one for you tonight. Magic and witchcraft in paranormal investigations. John L. Tenney, our guest, when we return right here to the very best in paranormal talk at radio. This is the Paranormal 60. I'm not going to stand here and listen to this baloney. He won't know. He doesn't stand for baloney. Sounds like a lot of supernatural baloney to me. Supernatural. Perhaps. Baloney. Perhaps not. My friends, you are in for a treat tonight. John L. Tenney is one of the most well-recognized and highly sought-after investigators of UFO, paranormal, and occult phenomena in the world. Mr. Tenney has been actively involved in the field of anomalistic, conspiratorial, occult, ufological, and paranormal research for well over three decades. John's columns and articles have been printed in magazines and newspapers worldwide, and due to his extended time involved in paranormal research, he has acted as a consultant for numerous companies, including NBC, ABC, A&E, Fox, Sci-Fi, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, and more. He has worked on numerous television shows, including Unsolved Mysteries, Sightings, Very Scary Stories, Paranormal State, The New Class, Ghost Stalkers, and Paranormal Lockdown, Hellier and Kindred Spirits. He is here for the first time visiting with us on the Paranormal 60. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome to the program, John Tenney. Hi, John. Hey, Dave. How you doing? I'm doing good, buddy. How about you? I am good. I am. This pod, this podcast has a shockingly small amount of hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am, uh, I'm glad we're able to finally connect and get you on the show. I do want to make a quick mention and you can tell people uh, you've got a great podcast. People can uh, follow as well. We have a link for it up on tonight's program guide. What's up weirdo. Tell us just a little bit about that. So the audience knows a little bit more about you and the work that you do and how they can keep up with you. Yeah. So I have this uh, podcast called what's up weirdo, obviously. And I do it with my best friend, Jessica. And even though we talk about a lot of ghosts and paranormal and UFO stuffs and horror movies, it really started as a way to kind of let people just hear a podcast of two friends talking. There's a lot of people out there who, for whatever reasons, it started during lockdown actually. Right. And, um, I know that I missed casual, weird conversation in the background of my life. So Jessica and I just started taping our weird conversations and putting them out to the public. I think it's pretty weird sometimes. Well, as it should with a show named what's up weirdo. I have had a chance to uh, know you for many years now and, and work with you at conventions and hear your many different lectures of which there are amazing amounts of them. And they are all hilarious, entertaining, and educational. I've learned a lot from you and try to bring some of that nuance to the talks that I give at these conventions as well. And I found that, especially hearing in the, the feedback that we get on, on these programs and, and at the live conventions, when you can intersperse humor into it and, and bring people along on the journey with, with different emotions as opposed to just blowing out a bunch of information, it really seems to click with people and connect and you've been doing this now for over 30 years. Has there been a pretty radical change in the way that you've seen the paranormal presented? Or do you feel you're kind of still on the same narrow track? It's a great question. I mean, for me, when I started lecturing in the early 90s, my mentors always really tried to impress upon me that, you know, if you're bored with your lecture, you can't even imagine the audience must be asleep at this point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I like to have fun. I'm up, I'm a goofball just like you. Mm -hmm. And the reality of the situation, and I've seen this accepted more and more over the years, which makes me really happy, which is people realize that what we do as paranormalists is silly. We're talking to invisible people and we're looking for monsters and we're chasing lights around in the sky I mean, this is kind of the wonder of childhood, right? Like we all did this when we were little kids. We just mm -hmm. didn't know that we were doing it. We were 
spooked out by the sounds of the creaking of the dark house and running around in the woods thinking there was something strange in the darkness and staring at the sky wondering what was up there. So it's just an extension of that. And I think a lot of people, yes, it's fun to get facts and figures and names and dates, but you have to embrace that silly side because I think, you know, we're talking about magic. I think that's where the magic really is. When I did the first Jericho cruise, what, four or five years ago now, uh, I told you that they wanted me to do a UFO watch. So I would just take a bunch of people on the side of the ship and we would hope to see UFOs or USOs. And and uh, you gave me some advice, very sound, cool advice. And I wasn't sure how it was going to turn out to have all these people come out on the side of a boat that's lit up as we look out into the dark, inky abyss of the Bermuda Triangle. And you had given me some of these little mental imagery and things to place with people and what to give and how to try to get back. And I can tell you, John, and I don't know if I've ever come back to you on this. We did the experiment and ended up seeing lights in the sky that were following us along the horizon line. And at first, some of the employees of the ship who actually came out to watch us with us were thinking, oh, maybe it's, I don't know, like a lighthouse on the edge we're just seeing, but they continued moving with us. And then one started going up and down like it had dropped beyond the horizon line. And I turned and I looked at my son, who is a retired Navy guy. And I said, is this because the boat is rocking or something? And he goes, no, Dad, we would have to be rolling for that thing to keep dipping. That's just showing off. It's letting us know that we're seeing something unreal. And my son was skeptical of this. The... Uh, of course, the employees of the ship were very skeptical of what we were doing, but everybody on board was absolutely flabbergasted. And we used, in in a sense, magic, right? <laughs> you gave us these kind of incantations, these manifestations to have happen, and it worked. Do you want to kind of walk people through that concept? I mean, when you were talking to me, you had told me about envisioning things and you know putting it in your hand something really negative about your life something that you wanted to get rid of and then kind of turning it into light turning it into a good thought and then kind of releasing it into the ocean because you had done it the other way for a cruise you'd been on and maybe you could start off by telling us what happened with that experiment yeah i was on a cruise too one of amy bruni's strange escapes and we were going from boston to the bermuda triangle and I had people go out there and I thought it would be funny to raise a sea monster. Uh, not really fully in my brain uh, understanding what could the ramifications of that mean. So right. we got everybody out on deck and I had them doing some incantations and they had their hands over the deck and they were all chanting. I got everybody chanting up, up, up and down from the darkness of underneath the boat and this very weird black cloud started to roll in toward the ship and everybody got extremely nervous. And so their mental state kind of broke mine too. I was getting nervous. I didn't know what was happening. And we were going through the tip of the meter triangle at the time. And as soon as the intention of everybody broke and everybody got nervous and started laughing, that black cloud kind of went away, but not more than seven or eight hours later, after we had all gone to sleep, all of the fog horns on the ship start blowing. And at some point during the night, our ship's navigation computer had turned off and we were literally now 50 miles off course in the Bermuda triangle. So everybody was freaking out going, we did something, we did something. And that was a great moment. But when we got back to Boston, one of the cruisers uh, started screaming and ran over and gave me a newspaper because the night after we did that experiment off the off the coast of florida in the bermuda triangle a missing sailboat that had gotten lost in the bermuda triangle like 25 years ago came up from the bottom of the bermuda triangle and washed up on the shore in florida and so we were all like we did that we did that we created it and what went from a really spooky thing at the time with that black cloud rolling and became again, you know, a really happy, funny memory for all of us. And maybe we did do something. The concept of putting something out there and conjuring manifesting. And I mean, is there really any difference between people using the more hip word of manifestation as there is to conjuring, like we would think in the world of magic? 
I don't think so. I, you know, I talk about magic and witchcraft in the paranormal and using it as a tool a lot. And I do it because I, I'm trying to break down those century old fears of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. And so even to the point of sometimes during my lectures, I'll talk about just how the words have changed, you know, in the meanings over the years, like if someone puts a curse on you, everybody immediately now, you know, it was a bad thing. I've, I've been cursed, but you know, etymologically curse comes from curses, which is the same etymological root as a river current. When you put a curse on someone originally, you were trying to change the course of their life, not for the worse, but for the better. You were trying to put them on a different current in the river. And once that started becoming really into practice in the 13th and 14th century, it was being done by people who weren't related to the church. And so the church was like, oh, curses are bad. We don't curse people. And so then curses became this negative thing. But originally you could, by cursing someone, by saying a magic word, we even call, you know, our, ba our bad words curses. Mm -hmm. um, by cursing someone, you were really just trying to move their life in a different direction. And it was up to the person whether their life went in a different direction. So, you know, conjuring, manifestation, it's all very similar, but it holds for many, many people a ton of fear. And that's what I would really like to get rid of. I mean, we've, we've become a community that is really good natured about it now, like I said earlier, but there's still a lot of inborn fear in people and a lot of family trauma and religious trauma that people carry with them. And I just want to move people a little bit further away from that by being goofy. And what I love about this is about a month ago, talking to Brad and Tim from Michigan Paracon, uh, I had said I, I had a, an idea for a course, a, a little uh, workshop I'd like to do. And they said, sure, what would it be about? And I said, I want to teach people magic. I want to bring magic in and show them how they can spell cast in their own life. And it was funny to see all these people, once they announced it, start responding. I didn't know Dave was part of the craft. I didn't know that he was part of the... And it's funny because... I think they're going to be sorely disappointed when they realize I'm not a, uh, you know, broom wielding carrier of the witch club, but <laughs> right. like you, I wanted to take this concept and bring it out to people, show them that they're, they're using magic every day and mm -hmm. how to start to focus that magic and have real change take place in their life. And then when I reached out and I said, John, I want to get you on the show. What topic should we talk about? And you threw this my way. I was like, all right. This is a great moment. So let's let's have this. And talking about the concept of utilizing witchcraft and magic in trying to communicate with the supernatural, be it creatures, UFOs, ghosts. Talk to me a little bit about some of the history of that and you know how it's been utilized through time and tide to actually thin the veil or to have these magical experiences. Yeah, you know. It, and like you were just to on a point you were talking about, you know, my magical rituals, the first ghost hunter that I ever met was a woman named Marion Kukolo and her name, her witch name was Gundella in Detroit. Uh, mm -hmm. She wrote a book, one of the first kind of seminal books for me to find called Michigan's uh, Michigan haunts and hauntings. And she was a wonderful witch, but a terrible researcher. Her book is filled with, you know, errors and names are misspelled, but there was enough there to, when I met her, ask her these types of questions, like how does witchcraft relate to it? And how does spellcrafting relate to it? And you were saying like, people don't realize they do magic every day in different ways. Uh, you know, I have a morning magical ritual that I do and people have trouble comprehending this, but part of my magical ritual is making my bed. I stand in my bed every day when I wake up in front of it. And when I flap those sheets out, you know, my arms are going up and down. It looks like a magical movement. And in the moments of making my bed, I fill my head with these thoughts of remembering how precious it is, precious it is to have a safe place to sleep, how lucky I am to have a home, to remember those people who don't have homes and don't have beds that are safe to sleep in. And that's the beginning of my day, this magical process of understanding the universe and taking just a moment to recognize this simple, small gesture that a lot of people like don't like to do and turning it into something very powerful mentally for me to carry through the rest of my day. Uh, and when you talk about the history of using magic to communicate with spirits or commune with the other side, 
worldwide, cross-culturally, for as long as humans have had spiritual and religious belief systems, they have done something very akin to magic and witchcraft, which is closing their eyes and speaking in their heads, knowing that their thoughts will be discerned by some invisible being somewhere. It's called prayer. Most people do it. And it is a very occult, magical concept that people just naturally do. I like that you bring it to that because that will, again, open paradigms for people that don't realize that so many of the things that we've been brought up in have been titled one thing, but really all kind of come back to the same concept of rituals, of following a certain norm in order to achieve a certain status. And, you know, in voodoo, you brought up the fact that people look at curses as a bad thing. You know, for many years, people believe the voodoo doll, thanks probably in part to Hollywood, was something evil. But what it actually came to was these pins were not to hurt, but that was to focus a point of energy, to focus the healing, set the manifestation and the intention to that place so that you could begin healing for that person. So many of the things that have been out there uh, that have been considered witchcraft really do come from a place of healing until greed gets involved, until someone decides, you know what, she's a great person who helped me birth my child and get rid of my headaches, but I really like her property and it's much closer to the waterline. I think she might be a witch. I mean, is, is that too boiled down? No, I mean, I see... Because maybe it's just, I mean, you and I have this, right? Like we talk to and interact with so many people who have so many weird practices, but throughout the day, I will see people doing magic and they don't know they're doing magic or I'll talk to someone and they'll say something and I'll be like, in my brain, I won't tell them outright, but I'll be like, oh, it's a magic thing. The most unmagical people have told me about like they cured a wart because they cut a potato in half and rubbed a potato on it and then buried it in their backyard, right? Like that's... That's treater magic. That's coming from, you know, the southern states of America. And it's been done by folk magic practitioners for as long as America has been America. Um, or I, I tell a story sometimes about a guy who was sitting at uh, the local bar that I go to. And he found out what I did and said that what I was doing was all hokum smokum and there's nothing to it and it's not real. And he was watching a Detroit Red Wings game. And... I let him sit there for a second. And then I said, so you're a big, big Red Wings fan. He goes, yeah, yeah. And I said, uh, is, is that your lucky Jersey? And he goes, yeah. He goes, I wear it whenever they play and I I'm growing my beard out so that we'll get into the playoffs. And I said, you're doing magic, dude. You're doing sympathetic magic. You think your lucky Jersey and you growing your beard out is helping that team win. That is magic. Why do you think it took such a, 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 a big leap from being this really kind of beautiful source of energy exchange to something that that turned dark is it simply and i don't want to you know i don't want to demonize the church and all of this but it, it seems that most of it is driven that way or personal greed and and that but it, do you have a bigger broader idea of where that comes from no i think it's just power structures and people wanting to be in control of something and if they don't understand it or they're not in control of it, they have to kind of warp and manipulate it away. And then, you know, it builds up over generations and people learn things from their families. But even if you look at, let's say, let's just take, and I'm just going to throw this to, into my imagination. You have something, let's say you have something going on for thousands of years. Let's say you have uh, people, and this is a thing, right? Like, let's say you have people taking um hallucinogenics to have some kind of spiritual experience and they'll talk about in this day and age right like they'll go to a place and there's all this like rhythmic drumming and chanting and they see all these weird colors and lights and it's filled with like different kinds of incense and smoke and like that is going to most catholic churches right like there's usually like chanting and humming and it's filled with incense and smoke and the windows are all these huge stained glass windows, which are obscuring and manifesting different light colors through as you're hearing about these. I mean, it's just the same thing. We're just, we're just doing it in different ways. I love that. And I, I want to, this weekend while I was gone and actually the last few months while I've been touring and doing all of these conventions, um, there were people that have come up to me 
And it kind of breaks my heart, John, because you could see this, this division line in them. They want to enjoy the paranormal. They want to be able to examine things and challenge things, but they've been brought up with the dogma that the church says we cannot do these things, that they are direct sins. And I guess what I'd like to do is I'll address people before we go to a quick break with this. This is the advice I've been giving is the Bible is filled with magic from page one to the final page. There is witches, there are angels coming down and impregnating humans, there are giants, there are fairies, there are uh, craft in the sky. And it is Jesus who says himself that all of these things I do, these miracles, these bits of magic, you can do as well with faith, with belief, which is magic. Faith in something you cannot see is magic. Belief in something that we cannot tangibly touch is magic. We are giving power to something that we are hoping will channel back good power to what we're, we're looking towards. And I tell people, when you read these rules of the Bible, it's pretty clear that the God of the Old Testament was a new God, and he was a jealous God, and he admits that he's a jealous God. And halfway through, when he gets to the New Testament, God has awoken and he has sent through magic his own son himself in a human form to show people that you can be this. It isn't just this up in the sky manifestation that you too have this ability. And then when they say to me, but Dave, the rules of the Bible. And I say, all right, well then we should begin by stoning you to death for wearing two different types of fabrics today. And have you had a period on the Sabbath? Because we probably should have put you to death years ago. Are we going to listen to those rules? and not the rules over here? Or are we going to just listen to the rules that seem to fit our needs best? And a lot of the people have had this kind of sigh of relief when I bring that up. And I said, the big thing is there are 10 major rules and one overwhelming rule. The 10 rules in the Bible are pretty clear. And none of them say to hate gays, to hate blacks, to hate the lower price people, the higher price. None of it says anything about hatred. And as a matter of fact, the one big rule that Jesus throws out in the New Testament is, and this rule above all matters, love your neighbor like yourself. Be kind. And that's the kind of magic that can make things happen. We have to take a quick break. We'll come back. More with John Tenney right after this. Hey, Minnesota, the Paranormal Expo is taking place at the St. Cloud Armory this weekend, only $7 at the door. There are paranormal encrypted teams and presentations, jewelry, healers, authors, and much, much more. That is an amazing Paracon that's taking place in St. Cloud, Minnesota this weekend, September 30th. And if you go on out there, you might just see Winnie Schrader. She'll be out doing tarot readings, so you can go on out, get a reading, meet some other like-minded individuals, and begin creating magic of your own. For more information, go check out the website darknessevents.com, and you'll find a link for that program and how you can go out there and see it, get your tickets in advance, or just head out to the St. Cloud Armory out in St. Cloud, Minnesota, this weekend. All right, we are back. John Tenney, our guest, as we talk about magic, magic witchcraft, witchcraft, and the, and paranormal. the paranormal. Now, John, if you could walk me through the concept then of utilizing these things to try to help communicate or open our world to having bigger experiences with what we refer to as the supernatural. For sure. I mean, a lot of people that are listening right now, I'm sure, already have had what I would consider, I consider any experience that's kind of supernatural, paranormal, metaphysical, huge. Uh, a lot of people think that that's some kind of, you know, height measuring contest where you've got to be abducted by aliens uh, three times a week and you have to talk to, you have to catch 70 EVPs every time you do an EVP session. But the majority of the people in the world have these moments of communication with the spirit world so individualized and unique and beautiful you, you all, you hear these, these messages, like people will tell me, you know, um, my father passed away and then a cardinal landed on the deck. Um, I found a, a squirt bottle cap, like these things that wouldn't mean anything to anyone else, but in the moment and in the mentality, like they realize that this is 
the high strangeness of another world finding a mundane and beautiful way to interact with them. So it already happens to people every time. I mean, you know, when a lot of people obviously talk about synchronicities and the universe sending things their way, but I do think that the universe is a little bit more goofy. I think it, it does things that it taps you on the shoulder with these little tidbits of, uh, do you want to play? Like it's kind of this thing that I always say where the universe taps you on the shoulder and says, do you want to play? It sends you a, a weird message or it, play you know you'll hum a song for some reason after having a dream and then you go to the grocery store and that song is playing and you that's the universe sending you a message asking you if you want to play now you don't have to but i encourage people because it leads to larger and larger games and it gets to a point where you do see a ghost when you go somewhere and it maybe blows your mind the universe knows to back off for a couple months and not do that again but when you're filled with good nature and happiness and positivity. Whenever I've investigated for ghosts, this, this is the way to communicate. Uh, you know, you, you don't walk into a location and, and ask a ghost to, you know, trip you or hurt someone that's in the room with you or ask the ghost how much it hurt when they died. And these are, these I find to be terrible, horrible things to do when first trying to communicate with something we as individuals have trouble communicating with other human beings now you're trying to communicate with an invisible denizen of some other realm and you're starting it off by asking how much it hurt when they died. Close your eyes, take a moment, clear your thoughts and just think to yourself, I want to communicate with whatever's here. And if you have a message, I'd love to hear it. I just want to know that you're here. I want you, I want to acknowledge that you existed, that you were important. Uh, if you can, I mean, one of the questions when I do EVP sessions that works so beautifully is I always say, instead of, can you tell me your name? Uh, cause I usually know the history of the building and I already know the spirit's name that I'm looking for. Right. But asking the question, can you tell me the name of someone you love? Or, you know, that, that's a powerful question because if we do carry parts of ourselves over into this other world, we carry those thoughts and those loves in our heart. And you find yourself looking very magical and ritualistic in a meditative state, sitting in a, in a dark room by yourself and connecting with the universe. That in itself is magical. Um, and then, you know, I also think that uh, I'm really here, here. You know what, Dave? This is interesting. So I, I am really, it's strange, all the paranormal shows that have been on television. Mm -hmm. I think that... I understand why children haven't been on paranormal reality shows. I 100% understand that. I am confused by the fact, I think the two most magical creatures in the world are children and animals. The fact that there hasn't been an animal paranormal reality show yet, it blows my mind. We've had so many opportunities for a group to have a dog or a cat or a bird. And birds can talk. Some of them can, you know, they have huge vocabularies, but uh, my friend Jessica, who do I, who I do What's Up Weirdo with, whenever we go places, she brings her dog, you know, her, her past, her dog who passed away, Bean, used to come. Now her dog Toad comes and animals know where it's weird. Uh, they don't, they're not blocked. Their brains aren't blocked with the thoughts of bills and how do I look? And mm -hmm. they know something is in a room and they either stay away or they charge toward it. And they're just these magical metrics that I, I'm super surprised it hasn't been on television. But they, they have their own type of magic. We know animals are magic. You can have rooms full of people telling you there's no such thing as hands-on healing or Reiki, and they can tell you it's all, you know, hoo-ha. But any person with a dog or a cat knows that if you've had a bad day, when you come home, your animal knows it, knows it immediately, comes to you, and, and touches you, and heals you. They put their head on your lap. They put their paw on your hand and you feel a little bit better. Even the cats will jump up on the back of your chair and lightly put a paw on your shoulder. Um, they are magical beings. And I think we miss that a lot of times. Oh, I completely agree. I think the cynical nature of the viewer might be what keeps some people from or production companies from utilizing animals because again, they're going to think the animal was trained or, 
you know, how was it edited? I, I think that's the main problem. The one I, I had somebody ask me today a question about bringing animals in and why we don't see more. I said, the problem is we can't always corroborate. I can't look at Lassie and go, is it a ghost girl? <laughs> okay. Is it the ghost of John Tenney? <laughs> All right, great. So we get this conversation. So I think if we, you know, once we get Skipper the dog that's willing to be able to do that and, and can communicate immediately, I think we'll find a TV show coming that way pretty soon. But you're right. There is magic in that having children, having animals. And I actually utilized my daughter in an episode of the Holzer files when we were trying to communicate with the ghost of a little girl who passed away from complications due to diabetes. This little girl only made her presence known to children. And we were three yeah. grown adults. And I asked my daughter and she made th two videos. And when we played those videos, I got EVP voices from the little girl. Not when we spoke to her, but when my daughter spoke to her. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. And again, I kind of said at the very beginning, you know, children live in a magical world that we used to live in, uh, paranormal investigating, doing witchcraft, doing magic, uh, as, as adults, it's a way to return to that world that we remember when you were, when you're, and everybody that's listening, when we were kids, you had openly full conversations with flowers and bees and trees and you went out in the woods and made magic potions out of mud and sticks and, and the rocks that you thought were special. Uh, you would ball up your fists and stand in a field and make the wind blow. Like all of these things were magical manifestations and they worked. You know, the bees talked back. The magic potion made you crazy. The, the wind blew hard on you when you clenched your fists. There's even been some research, you know, it's been in the past like five or six years looking at uh snow days and the amount of children wanting there to be snow and is like was it really a snow day or did the children actually make it snow because they wanted a snow day so badly and we forget it as we get older it's not real or it was just something silly that happened one time but then we get older and we start to return to it you actually kind of inspired yet another practice that i do from time to time uh, and talking about talking to trees and the butterflies and the and there are times when there's a bug flying around and everybody's trying to smack it and kill it and I'll go come on little friend let's go let's go outside and it'll land near me and allow me to pick it up and take it outside when I put the intention out that I don't want to kill you you fell in the wrong place let's get you someplace safe and I remember hearing you talk about killing spiders at one point and saying how would you feel if your child walked down the wrong street? Would you want somebody to kill her or walk her out of that area and get her someplace? And that really resonated with me. And so I do try to do that. My kids think I'm a hippie from time to time when I'll, you know, grab the bug to take outside as opposed to stomping it like, uh, like I might have a few years back. But again, speaking to this creature you think would have no consciousness or understanding and suddenly it lands next to you and allows you to scoop it up and take it outside. What, what other sense is it than magic? that you're creating out of kindness again. Yeah. And it's surprising to me, you know, when I do my lecture and I talk about spiders, there's a lot of people who don't like spiders, so they don't like that part of the, the lecture, but the, the moment of picking up something that is small and being kind to it. I tell people this all the time. If you want to experience a magical moment, I've always been like, it, and it's been quick. I've always been returned with kindness right after I've saved a bug from being in my house. And as paranormalists, as people who believe in an afterlife, if you kill a spider in your house, you didn't get rid of it. Now it's there forever. Now it's, and and now you can't smash it out of existence. Yeah, you, how many ghost shows have you seen where people are just walking down a hallway and they're like, something touched my face and there wasn't there. Yeah, it was a spider ghost, probably. Someone killed it a hundred years ago and it's still hanging on a web in the middle of the hallway. When I visited with the Ghost Adventures crew a number of years ago at uh, Stardust Ranch in Arizona, um, part of the moment of trying to make communication when I was left alone on this mountain, I, I turned over my phone, I turned over the walkie-talkie, and I put myself in a vulnerable spot, saying that if they're intelligent enough to traverse universes or, or dimensions, they're going to know if I can call for help. And when, when they left with the communication devices, I just opened up to the sky and I said, I'm, I'm here, I'm available, and I want to have this moment. And I was actually able to capture a flying craft on the night vision camera that I had. And I felt like being vulnerable in that spot made me a little bit more uh, accepting and hopefully 
whatever was watching me was accepting of my situation. And so seeing how people treat animals and treat these moments and seeing response back, the, the big footer people I know that aren't famous, that aren't in the field, they're the ones that commune and will talk to the creatures in the woods and leave them gifts and tokens. We'll have great communication. The ones that are out there trying to film them and trap them and capture them, they remain elusive. But these other people are having unicorn experiences regularly. Yeah, I I had a UFO experience a few years ago with a friend. We were driving through Michigan's Upper Peninsula and we got out and I have on the same kind of ilk. Like I think that they can probably read my thoughts. And we got out of his truck, you know, four o'clock in the morning and there are these weird lights dancing around in the sky. And I said to my friend Mike at the time, I said, listen, we're just going to, we were scared. I'm telling you, even after all this, you know, to be in the dark and have these weird lights, you never know what's going to happen. And so there's a, a little bit of fright in there, which makes it exciting. Mm -hmm. But I said, we're just going to, we're just going to focus our thoughts on the watching them. And we're just going to ask them if they're there. And we both did. And all the lights stopped in the sky and then they kind of coalesced and flew directly over the head, over the top of us and then just zipped off into the darkness. And it went from this moment of kind of panic, fear, and fright into a really sort of beautiful, startling, wonderful moment, realizing you're connected to the cosmos. And I don't know how many people would have gotten that moment. They'd have the cool story of being scared seeing ufos but like now in my brain i can make an argument that i had some kind of you know psychic connection to them and that again makes it not scary but wonderful i know uh being friends with the new kirks you've seen them and have worked with them extensively in in different elements of paranormal investigations and i for the first time during the haunted salem live watched them utilize a sigil in order to try to open a pathway or communication. And that was something that really kind of interested viewers around the world with the concept of if the sigil is in this position, you're open to conversation. If you turn it around, it's supposed to shut things down. And I, I was left wondering though, does it matter what you draw? Is it the intention you put into the symbol that you've created to open a dialogue? Or do you believe that there are truly magical, uh, sigils and designs that are meant to bridge this chasm. I think there's a, a myriad of ways to, to sigil working. Um, and I don't know if there is a single symbol that represents something. I do think that if a symbol is around long enough and enough people think about it and put their ideas, thoughts, and intentions into it, then it can come to mean something. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I worked in advertising for years and years and years. I was the head of an advertising design department and, and advertisers use magic all the time. I mean, when we look at corporate logos and corporate sponsorships, if you don't think that there's magic involved in that, you're wrong. There is a picking of certain words. There is a locking and repatterning of thoughts and phrases. Um, the, the way that tunes are crafted for a jingle, the, the way that a logo looks. There's a reason why things like the Nike swoosh doesn't even have to say Nike anymore on it. You know, these things are embedded at, at, and people don't, perhaps the advertisers don't know they're doing magic, but as a person who does practice magic in the advertising industry, I'm like, oh, we're, we're creating a sigil. Like we're, we're empowering this logo to mean something when people see it and then people will feel and resonate with it. Uh, but I think there's a, a, I think we do it all the time. I think that, you know, a lot of sigils are based on really quick drawings and then breaking down the lines and then kind of abstracting them to get to a, a, a certain form. Most people do this when they're talking on their phone and there's a piece of paper in front of them, right? Like all of a sudden you just start drawing these weird shapes and objects and scribbles and we call it doodling. But you're really just trying to make manifest that that those thoughts in your head, those unconscious thoughts and desires. And it's always funny for me. I remember my mom, whenever my mom would be on the phone, um, she would just draw flowers, like tons and tons of flowers. And it was just this calming thing that she did. And I, I went to one friend's house and for years and years, he's a cartoonist. When he would be on the phone, this is back when people had landlines uh, for years and years, he would, 
draw houses when he wherever he was on the phone. And he bought the first time he bought a new house, his doodles changed. And he started drawing like uh, office building. And I was I realized like he was the first time I realized like maybe people are actually doodling like the things that they want to make manifest. They're unconsciously doing it. Like was he drawing a house because he wanted a house? And then when he got a house, he could move on to the next doodle. So I think that it's so tied in, especially sigil work and, and symbol work. Sure, they can they can mean something after hundreds of years if the same people keep using them. But that's why I, I love still writing letters to people and that point of contact between the, the surface of the paper and the pen and my hand and my brain. Um, you know, a pencil is the most magical of wands. It takes something that's in your head and this stick of wood with the power of your hand and your thought and a piece of paper can bring it into reality. You can actually make a picture out of your head with this little piece of wood. And so, you know, and people miss the magic of something as simple as that. I love, I love the beautiful simplicity of the ideas that you're sharing with us and showing that there is magic in even the simplest of things, the intention settings. Shane Pittman and I, when doing the Holzer files, people would often ask, well, you guys are out there doing it. Is it really always that active? And I said, we, we had a ritual when we would go into a place we would together kind of close our eyes, take some deep breaths, and just imagine what this place was like at the time it was the most active. If it was a hospital, we would listen for the sounds of the footfalls, the beeping, the calls for the nurse, the uh, you know the wheels and carts going up and down the, the hallways. And I called it uh, spiritual archaeology, trying to get myself to that point to have a connection, letting them know that I was sincere about this, not just two bumbling goofs walking around in a dark room, but that we came there with a reason. And here is where we're looking to connect to like a phone line, right? The old switchboards. We want to plug into this era and want to see if we can make communication to the spirits and the beings that live in that era. Yeah, absolutely. And approaching it again with kindness, I actually, when I was talking about the UFO stuff, um, I'm a big proponent of a little bit of fright and fear. Uh, fright and fear, I know that people don't like it. A lot of people are would like to get rid of it. But fright and fear has kept human beings alive for 500,000 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, whether or not anyone wants to admit it, fear kept everybody alive. Uh, it, you didn't get eaten by the tiger. It, you know, you found ways. But also dispelling some of the fear. It's okay to have a little bit and kindness through communication that actually, I'm sorry, I'm going to tangent off. I did a lecture one time at the Detroit public library and a church found out that I was going to be there. And so they came and protested. There were about 35 people outside and they had made their signs, um, stop this man's war lockery. And you know, this man is, uh, giving our children to the devil. And I was just there to talk about UFOs. Like, I, I had no idea what was going on, but when I saw it, uh, they didn't know who I was. So when I got there, I just asked them if I could join them. They were very happy to have another person. So I walked around and carried protest signs about myself and chanted with them. And then when the librarian came out and got me, uh, I gave them back their signs. They were all of course, very shocked that they had been protesting with the guy they were protesting against, but I stood on the steps and I kind of held my hands out. And they all got real quiet. And I was like, you know, Pater Nostrum, Kiernes Celes, Sanctu Vecector Nomen Tum. Like, and they were screaming. And all I was doing was the Lord's Prayer in Latin. Like, like it would have, like, it was the funniest thing because I'm like, if you actually knew the, like the, the Lord's Prayer in Latin, you would have all been doing that with me. So there can be goofiness and fear and silliness, but I, kindness is the way to connect with everything for sure. I a hundred percent agree with that and love that you're sharing that element because that is something that is part of magic that a lot of people don't know about. And when you think about the fact that, listen, there's black magic, there's white magic, there's good magic, there's bad magic, there's good people, there's bad people. And when you're putting forth an effort, when you do something negative, you're probably getting a lot of negative back in your life. And I do know a lot of the people that are the most vindictive, petty, jealous, rage-filled people seem to have a lot of crap going wrong in their lives. <laughs> and it's that that uh, concept that what you put out there returns back to you. 
And I will admit that I've, I've lived a very blessed life and have had things fall into my lap that I have no idea why they're there, but I'll continue to do my best to try to put good out there and try to make these things as, as good as I can be open with people and, and examples of it. And then I see this coming. And then when I start getting into that screwed up mindset, my phone doesn't work. My computer keeps glitching out on me. I'm having bad time. It's, it's, you, it's again, that exchange of energy that when you're in that negative place, you bring the negative about you. And when you lift yourself, even in a, in a damnable day and lift yourself back out of it, you get into a better thing. When everybody comes up to my table at a conference and they're like, Dave, how you doing today? I go, I'm doing great, but I'll get better. And they all start laughing and I go, Hey, you got to have a baseline to start. So let's start it great and just aim for better. And people, Oh, that's a great idea. I, I like that. I should do that. Right. And also they walk away with a, a beat in their step. Words are so powerful. And when the words are backed with an action, it, it shows magic come about and you can literally change the altitude of somebody's day in the way that you look at them, engage them and the words that you share with them. And that is magic. Like you said, so many people are doing magic every day. They have no clue that it exists. Yeah. And I couldn't agree more. And, you know, when it comes to ghost hunting or paranormal investigating with magic, you know, people will ask me like, what's a ritual I can do, you know, what you can do is you can walk into the uh, the location that you're investigating, right? And right before you walk in, again, you can clear your head and you can think, I'm just going to communicate with whatever's here. And when you walk in, the magic words that you can say are, that I can, my magic words are, hi, my name is John. I'm from Michigan. I'd like to talk to you. Those are magical words, mm. especially for someone who may be in there that's lonely, that is just looking for someone to talk to. Instead of chasing people through the house, you know, I, I was at a location or I did a lecture of trying, I know that we're probably closing in on the end, but I did a lecture at a comic book store recently because I'm a goofball and I love comic books and it was kid friendly. And so I asked, does anybody have a ghost in their house? And this little boy raised his hand. He was like probably seven. And he said, there's a ghost in my house. And his parents looked shocked. Like they had no clue. <laughs> and they were like, we do. And he goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, there's a ghost in my closet. And I said, are you afraid of it? And he said, yes. And I said, okay. And I go, if, if you were in a house and you didn't belong there and you knew it and you were, you were scared, where would you hide? And he goes, uh, probably the closet. And I said, yeah, maybe that ghost is scared of you. The places that people hide in houses when, when they're not supposed to be there, you would hide in a closet, you would hide under a bed. You would hide in the basement. You would hide in the attic. These are the places that we find ghosts. And it's almost as if they remember that they're not supposed to be there. So they're going to try and hide from us. So when we go into those locations, right, let's try and make them know that it's okay to be there. Inviting them into your circle, inviting them. And, and I've tried to do that every place we go. We were just doing investigations in England. I said, my name is Dave, and these are my friends. We've come here to speak with you, and we'd like to invite you into the circle, and we ask you in peace and love. I promise we don't mean you any disrespect. And you're right. And people are like, how do you get such great EVP? And there you go. I mean, not even thinking about it, but you just answered a question that I have been thrown out to people for 18 years. Why are our basements, closets, and under our bed haunted? You're right. That's the place for them to hide when they don't know where they belong. That's powerful, man. And, and you just said it when you were talking about your introductions in locations, when we talk about magic words, you know, you hocus pocus, abracadabra, whatever people want to say, the words that get the most response from people are hello. You can walk up to almost anyone and say hello and immediately get a response stranger or otherwise walk down the street, walk past someone and instead of averting your eyes, smile and go, hi. They'll probably say hi back or nod. You'll get some kind of response. And when you talk about powerful magic words, when you love someone and someone loves you and you look at each other and you say, I love you to someone, you feel the word. It resonates an energy through your entire body. I mean, these are the powerful words, right? And of course, hate is in there too. When someone screams, I hate you. But 
I always feel like when someone screams, I hate you, or when someone is like being a troll on the internet and saying terrible things, right? You, I don't feel hate so much. I always feel sadness when I hear it. Like it's, it doesn't hold the power that people think it holds. Mm. They, they think it holds this, this hateful power, but in reality, it just shows me how sad they are, which makes me, you know, kind of want to be nicer because I don't ever want to get into that part of the system. When we did ghost of devil's perch on the TV show and people watched things happen to me and on holes or files and then ghost of devil's perch, the, the overwhelming sense is, aren't you terrified? You've been hit, you've been bitten, you've been pushed, you've been scratched. And they said, no, I choose not to look at it through the eyes of fear. I look at it as a gift. John's ghost reached out to me. Okay, you're frightened, you're scared. So many people have come through here trying to communicate with you and you're lashing out. Now that we're past that, John, I'm staying. You didn't scare me out, so let's talk. What can I do to help you? And I've, I've really tried to empower myself and I try to empower other people. When you feel the most frightened is when you need to take that control back and you don't have to do it with the damnation of the man and the savior and the name and the, this, you can do it with kindness and just say, Hey, you're frightening my children. You're, you're upsetting the balance in my house. If there's a problem, communicate to me, what can I do to help you? And, and that's when we've gotten our best EVP, when we've gotten our best communication, either through visual or audio. And, you know, that is again, powerful spells, right? Words are, are so powerful and the meaning behind them. And I think spirits can sense if you're there for a TV show, or if you're there to legitimately try to help spirits. And, um, you know, so I, I, I love the stigma of taking fear or, or I love breaking the stigma of fear and turning it around and making it something that empowers you that gives you that and you, you empower that young boy that now he can connect with that spirit because he knows what it would feel like to be afraid. And instead of now looking at this as some kind of terrifying creature in his closet, it might just be a little lost soul that needs a friend or somebody that will be kind to it. And that's, that's remarkable. We have to take a, a real quick break. We'll come back. We've got a few more minutes with our guest, John Tenney. Stay tuned. We'll be back right after this. Haunted Magazine, issue 38, Hot Summer Frights, is an electrifying edition that will send shivers down your spine. Dive into a world where history and mystery, the normal and the paranormal, intertwine. In the latest edition, we look at the Hell House hauntings, the terror of the War Minster thing, the Borley Rectory, Sin Eating in Shropshire, and just what the heck is the Grampus? You can find our magazine at the website hauntedmagazineprintshop.com and selected outlets in the UK, Canada, Australia, and the United States. So grab your copy today. And remember kids, don't be normal, be paranormal. Hey, the Paranormal 60 Swag Shop is open. We have brand new t-shirts. We've got baseball jerseys, fanny packs. We've got makeup kits. If you want it, it's weird. We've got it. Go check out Paranormal60SwagShop.com. There's a link for it on tonight's program guide. Innovation, creation, vitality, and joy are the pulse of MySoulTopia.com with many custom creations for the mind, body, and spirit, along with classes, intuitive sessions, coaching, and healing energies. MySoulTopia.com strives to bring sophistication with a twist to the metaphysical and the holistic market, while raising the community's vibration and channeling the new paradigm, which means new and exciting adventures for all. MySoulTopia.com is utopia for your soul. Visit MySoulTopia.com, your one-stop shop for all your metaphysical needs. Offering hand-selected crystals and crystal jewelry with prices to fit every budget. MySoulTopia.com offers the best selections of tarot and divination cards by top designers. Expertly curated and award-winning book collections 
top authors on every subject you'll need on your spiritual journey. My Soultopia is also proud to offer the finest singing bowls and an eclectic collection of the most amazing gemstones, crystals, and crystal jewelry from the top metaphysical designers in the world. MySoulTopia.com is always your one-stop shop for award-winning mixes of Florida water, sage spray, and other spiritual protection. So begin your journey with the best resource, MySoulTopia.com. That's MySoulTopia.com. Why mess with the rest when you can start with the best? MySoulTopia.com. Again, that's M Y. S-O-U-L-T-O-P-I-A dot com. Hey, this weekend you can have a walk in the past with me, Josh Hurd, and a lot of other great paranormal enthusiasts. September 30th, 2023, we'll be at the Horridge House and Vinton Train Depot. Chad Lindbergh, another special guest that will be on hand, will be investigating, we'll be talking, we'll be meeting and greeting, and we'd love to see you there. There's more information about that at Darkness Events. Dot com. And if you're looking for the ultimate fun this Halloween weekend, October 27th and 28th, join me in Napanock, New York at the Haunted Shanley Hotel. I'll be there with Scotty the Medium, and we will be investigating for the weekend. There'll be some great presentations, hands-on learning for how to communicate with the spirit realm. So if you're interested, again, check out our website, darknessevents.com. There's a link for that right here on today's program guide. We're back with John Tenney. And uh, as we're wrapping up for this evening, John, people that are interested in making communication with cryptids, creatures, uh, UFOs, aliens, ghosts, there's always fear based behind it that what if we attract the wrong thing? What's your advice to people that might be walking in that uh, lane when concerned about, you know, dabbling in the paranormal? Oh, your mic's not on for some reason. We're getting no audio from you. You're unmuted. There we go. There we go. Yeah, there you are. Okay. You know, for some reason, um, I was saying earlier, we have difficulty divining the means and motivations of human beings. So when you're dealing with the means and mechanisms of the spirit world, it gets even harder. Uh, you know, when people walk into a location and something scratches the side of their chest, you know, they the immediate reaction is they're being attacked by a demon or, and the reality of the situation is like, it might be a very happy dog that's in the location, right? Like there, there might be a great Dane in that location that has been looking for someone to talk to it and pet it. And it jumps up on your shoulders and, and for whatever reason, scratches you or pushes you. And so the immediate jump is, oh, my God, something's attacking me. Yeah, a big, lovable Great Dane. Or if you're tripped, I mean, a tiny little chihuahua might be there at your feet. So, you know, I know that there is fear involved, that people, you know, demons sell. They make TV watchable and all of that. But the reality is, if you spend your life being kind and being goofy and being happy and kind of practicing happy magic, right? You're going to meet a lot of people who like you. You're going to make a lot of friends and we're all potential ghosts. So, <laughs> I mean, at some point in the future, you might be dealing with a ghost that remembers you and is like, Oh, I love that guy. I used to love listening to that guy. <laughs> or I love that lady. She's my, she right. was the best. She had all the crystals in her pocket. Like the best way to deal with, Communication is kind of forward think that. And for all the future ghosts out there that are watching right now, right? Like cultivate your happiness now. This is the, your chance to laugh. You don't know what it's going to be like on the other side. We really don't. And so try and fill this life that we have right now up with as much laughter and po as possible because some of it might resonate over into the afterworld and people will someday walk into your house and go, oh, someone was really happy here. Do you think that some of the beings we see at the end of our life trek might be those spirits, those energies that we've come into contact with that were unseen to us in the living force, but they resonated with us? I do. I, I, I have this feeling that, uh, you know, 
there are a few quote unquote ghosts and spirits that I've had multiple interactions with in different locations over the years. And I've always hoped that uh, someday I'll be able to meet them on an even playing field. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to say, boy, that, that being a live thing was really weird. Right. And they're like, yeah. Okay. Now you see that guy over there who's alive. Let's go bother him for a while. I like it. John is a, a remarkable speaker. I've got a link for his website so you can see where he's going to be, how to follow him. If you're interested in booking him for your paranormal or not paranormal events, you just want a great speaker that can really get into the heart of a situation. The link's down below. There's also a link for you to find his podcast, What's Up Weirdo. Make sure that you check that out and rate and review them wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts, because that does go a long way to help the people that you love and admire get a bigger and broader audience. It gets spread out that way. John, what's coming up next for you? Where can people uh, keep up with you as well, aside from the website and the podcast? Anything else exciting happening? I'll I'll be at Mackinac Island this weekend with Amy Bruni's Strange Escapes. The weekend after that, I will be doing Haunted Heartland in Omaha, Nebraska. Then I have two weeks off, and then I'll be in England for Sage Para, Parafest. And then... Uh, there's a bunch after that too somewhere. People can go to weirdlectures.com or just follow me on Twitter. I'm always talking about where I'll be. Fantastic. Thank you very much, John. And also the music is setting itself off by itself. Thanks to all of you for tuning in and spending some time here with us. And, and again, may the darkness be just a little bit more light with the information that we share here. And make sure to share this information with others that might be walking in a place of fear or wanting to understand the magic that's around us every day. Take the stigma and fear away from those things and empower yourself that if you walk in a place of kindness and love, that not only will the living world improve for you, but your communication to the things outside our normal realm might be just a little bit closer to you as well. We'll be back again Wednesday with a brand new episode and the Paranormal 60 News crew right here on the Paranormal 60.